Hey, so today's video is on Open Status. Open Status is an open source monitoring service. So what that means is it will check if your website is up like every 10 minutes or so and it will have a beautiful status page that your users can see as well and it will notify you if the site is down. So let's take a look at the project itself, um, do a quick demo of how it works. So here I have a page I set up a while ago for a project that I run. Uh, you can view the different data here. You can see it's being pinged from Frankfurt um, every minute or so. You can ping from lots of different regions. So here are sort of all the different regions they support. I believe this is every Vercel region. Um, in terms of the UI, it's all Shad CN. If you're familiar with that style, here you can see a lot of the components. Um, you can have your own public uh, status page for users to take a look at. So if we do visit here, you can see that on ShareMint we've had no incidents um, in like since I've launched this page basically. And uh, here there's sort of an incidents page as well. So that's the project and we're gonna dive into the code now. The project uses Next.js, Tailwind, Terso for the database, Tinybird, and Tailwind CSS and Chad CN. I'll dive into each of these for a second. These are sort of some really cool uh, new technologies to take a look at. So Terso is SQLite for the edge. What does that mean? Basically, if you go to the Terso website, um, in a usual project, what will happen is you might be serving, you might, your servers might be as close to the user as possible. So for example, um, let's say your user is in New Jersey and the database is in New Jersey, then your, and the servers in New Jersey, then it's gonna be really quick. But let's say that user is now actually in Singapore, so even if the server's in Singapore and the user's in Singapore, okay, that's great, but you need to fetch the data from New Jersey, send it back to them, and as you can see, it's gonna take 500 milliseconds instead of 50 milliseconds, because even though the server and the user are close, the database isn't close. So basically what Terso does is it gives you a SQL database and if we, it basically replicates it in every single region. So here you can see, I guess, in Japan, Shinjuku, um, it, the, if the database server and the user were there, it's super quick at only 27 milliseconds. You can see even in the same region, it's like it, these numbers are even quicker basically. So if you want like amazing performance, this is one way to go about it and definitely worth a look. Tiny Bird, it's basically click, it's serverless ClickHouse. If you're not familiar with ClickHouse, basically if you want to like sort of process a huge amount of data really quickly, um, it's very, very good at doing that. It will, like, you could send it tons and tons of data. You can query it with SQL and it's going to give you sort of lightning fast results. So definitely worth taking a look at. Um, I might actually do a full video on this later. You can see sites like Super are using it. Um, dub.sh that we saw in a previous video. Here you can see the dub logo. Um, and a whole bunch of other websites that are using it. I think we will see um, the uh, our website come up in a second. Open status here, you see. It's also one of the logos mentioned. Serverless ClickHouse for developers is basically what it is. In terms of uh, the UI, so it's using Shad CM. We've covered this a bit before, but here you can see all the different components. So you can see the calendar component. You can build all these things super quick. Um, here's the code. You just sort of copy and paste the code in um, and you can edit it as you want. What's nice here is you have a lot of control over be being able to edit it. It doesn't sort of give you just a full component and you pass in props, but you can actually be like, oh, I don't like that button, you can completely change it. Uh, so that's something really nice about Shad CN. So taking a look at the code itself, um, we can see here, if you look at the structure of the project, you'll notice there isn't too much code and there's not that much in the package JSON. So what's going on here? Well, it's a monorepo, and so a lot of the uh, dependencies are in the, inside individual packages and the apps themselves. Here you can see any project you see like this, it's becoming quite common to see projects like this using Turbo. So you will see um, a, a turbo.json file if they're using that. There's two parts to Turbo. One is um, a ROS powered successor to Webpack, which is really quick. And by the way, you can you benefit from Turbo Pack even if you're not using a monorepo. So it's something to take a look at. Um, here you can sort of see using Next.js sort of the, the speed of things. I guess this is the build speed um, But yeah, it has this caching functionality and you, especially if you're working with multiple developers It can really sort of speed things up. Uh, this is more for internal developer experience It's not a must and then you have turbo repo, which we're gonna take a look at now. So here you can basically see um, we're using pmpm for the project and Is there anything here you can sort of see the environment variables? Uh, where the output, and I guess there's not really too much over here. 
Here you can see our PM PM workspace. So that's it's similar to an NPM or YARM workspace. But here you can see basically where the different parts of that app are. Here you can see sort of the apps folder, the packages folder, and a few more things they've put in here. Um, so basically what this means is um, the, the Turbo app, the mono repo, is built uh, split into a few different parts. One, we have different apps here. So here you can see we have a docs website. Um, this is a Next.js project inside here. And we have a, another Next.js project inside here, which is the web app. So the web app, this is the site we took a look at before. This is sort of the landing page, the app itself. And then the documentation, you can see it's docs.openstatus.dev and it's sort of its own thing as well. Um, if we sort of just take a look around, um, the docs are like sort of pretty like bare bones. There's not too much happening. You can just see it's a bunch of MDX files. It's basically markdown files with code. Um, and if you see here, getting started, we'll see sort of there should be a getting started here somewhere. Um, and that, that this translates one to one. So here you sort of have within the same repo, you have both the, um, the doc site and the, the main site as well. And what's cool as well is that you can sort of have your own packages and these packages can be shared between the different apps as well. So if we here you can see it's Tailwind and, and so on. Um, here you can see sort of the packages specific to the doc site. Um, it doesn't look like it's actually using any common packages here. So it's sort of just its own standalone thing. And then we have the web app and this basically uses lots of different packages from within the project. Um, so if we take a look at the package.json here, this is a great way to start looking at any open source project. But here you can see all the different open uh, open status packages. They're all sort of work, uh, workspace packages. Um, you can see analytics, API, and so on. And if you want to see where those are defined, so let's say we want analytics, we'll take a look here and we'll see we'll have our own uh, package JSON for the analytics. You can see it basically uses TypeScript and a few other things. It's using T3. Zod and anyway, and everything around Jitsu, everything around the analytics basically is happening here. It's a super small package, um, which but yeah, for good and for bad, but it makes it sort of really easy for us to understand at least. Um, and all this, all this does is it exports the track analytics. If you want, you could export this same analytics package into the doc site and use it there as well. Um, so you sort of don't have to copy and paste the code between the two doc, uh, between the docs and the web project and so on. So here you can sort of see these are the shared packages. We'll take a look at some of them. Um, here you can see Radix UI. This is a lot of the Shad CN stuff I mentioned. Shad CN uses Radix UI behind the scenes. Um, you can see a whole bunch of other stuff that's being used. We're using Sentry. We're using Stripe Next JS. Um, yeah, a whole bunch of other things. So we'll take a look at how these are actually used. Um, let's search for something in the project. Let's search for open status API. How is the API package used? Um, or you know what, this is just like a really simple one I looked at before, the plans package. So if we take a look here, um, if we sort of close this analytics, you can see here there's another small package. All it is is an index.ts, super, super small, this package. Um, you can see it uses open, it relies on open status DB, which is another package we have. And then it, it's also using Zod, but basically all this does is to, or you can, you can see we just import Do, uh, Zod. We import this schema from the database package and we export uh, a configuration object. So if I just take a look where is all plans used here, you can see the different uh, packages or apps it's used in. You can import a package into another package. You could in, uh, import it into the apps folder as well. Here you can see we're using all plans. Um, we import from app open status plans. This is basically from within the workspace. You don't have to publish this to NPM, even though it looks like it's an NPM package. You can publish it to NPM, which is sort of one of the advantages. Imagine sort of this was a UI library and you want everyone to be able to use it or you have other projects within the company that you want people to use. So you could publish it as an NPM package from this mono repo and then uh, other people can be using it too. But in short, uh, if we go to all plans here, you can see it's the, ob the objects being used and anyway, that being used to see if the limit has been hit. Um, or yeah, yeah, whatever the <laughs> monitor's limit, uh, we're basically checking that here. Oh. Anyway, um, so you can see it's used in a few different places in the app. So and now that we've sort of covered Turbo Repo, I will give a quick demo about actually how you can set up Turbo Repo yourself. 
because this jumping into the project this can look sort of really daunting and overwhelming it's like wow how did this develop put this all together and so on a big part of it is actually sort of just set up out the box view when you install turbo which we'll see in a second another thing i'll mention is it can definitely be overkill doing some of these things sometimes it's like oh new shiny object i want to use that i'm going to turn my app my repo into a mono repo i really need that a lot of the time you don't need it um, as we've seen in other projects you can do really cool things even without something like turbo um, what are the major advantages you know if you took all these packages just to put, stuck them in the web folder i think the app would sort of be just as good um, i'm not sure that actually any of this is going to be reused in other ways basically so this de i mean it's definitely sort of been organized nicely but really you know if we just move this into oh well, i don't want to do that but if we are if we just move that into the web folder um, the app would work just as well um, but you know if let's say they want to reuse tiny bird somewhere in the future or the plans they have and so on um, and as they build more projects here it could be you could imagine oh there's going to be a react native project here in the future so now you could start importing all these different things into the react native app that's sort of being listed here and you sort of you wouldn't have to sort of rewire everything and like pull out plans and so on the last thing i'll say here is if you did have to do that it's actually not the biggest deal like if you have your project already and now it's like okay i have my next js project now i want to convert it into a turbo repo i've been through this process myself it doesn't take that much time and then you can add the extra app so now you want to sort of share the plans between uh the react native app and the next js app you can go and do that and it's not going to be that much work so up to you if you decide to use it but in short don't be don't feel like pressured to use something like this um, you know, if you do it, great. This app looks like it's sort of been really well built, but you don't have to. So let's take a look at Turbo Repo. This will really help us understand uh, this project better and hopefully make this feel a lot less overwhelming. And so if you see other Turbo or even Mono Repo projects in the future, you'll take a look and you won't be like, oh, wow, like, how do I do that? You'll understand how it's sort of been created. So the first thing to do is we're going to go to the Turbo website and you can see we can basically go and follow this command. Um, I'm going to quickly run it, um, install it. So you can see it's using PMPM to install it. And we're just going to use all the defaults here, I think. Let's use PMPM. It's going to download the files. And now this is finished. That took around uh, less than a minute or so. Here you can see sort of the, the structure that's been built from the beginning. We have a docs pro uh, app, a web app, exactly like the... Uh, open status uh, project and you can see we have three packages that have been created here you can see sort of the different commands if we want to go build the project if we want to want to run it in development lint it and so on um, you can also use remote caching if you log into vercel so basically what remote caching would be will be doing is let's say you've gone and installed all these dependencies and done a build on your own machine instead of having to sort of go and do it all over again um and like let's say your your coworker is doing it on their own machine and they're in the exact same state as you the exact same dependencies and so on you just built it it will basically use turbo to basically make it as quick as possible and it can even help if you deploy if you build it locally and then you actually pushed it to the cell the cell can sort of reuse what's already been built so i guess that's the name the goal is sort of turbo speed and now i've actually gone and run uh pmpm run build so i I was in the wrong uh, folder first, but I basically seeded in. I ran build. You can see here sort of the next JS, next JS app is being built for the two projects that we have. Um, and you can see two are successful. That whole thing took 13 seconds. But now if we run it again, basically you'll see it took 239 milliseconds. Why is that? Usually if you run sort of next JS build twice, it's going to take a long time. And, you know, if you have a bigger project, this is, could easily take a minute, two minutes to run build. Um, here, basically, because we had just run it, it's basically reusing the cached pieces. And if we go actually and change one of the apps, so let's see, um, this is a demo. So let's go and do that. Let's run the build again. You can see one of the apps is now it's actually taking a bit of time. So we'll see how long this takes. And you can see, so we had to do two tasks. One of them was cached, the other wasn't. So in total, it took six seconds. To, to run that so instead of taking six seconds for each project it only one basically was immediate because it was all cached and the other actually took some time to build so if we do it now again 255 milliseconds and you get this cool um 
terminal gradient style, which I didn't know was possible before Turbo. Before Turbo. Um, but yeah, th so that's all very nice, basically. And th only this package rebuilt because only this file had changed, basically. Um, if we take a look at what has actually been built, so the main packages you get here, this is, you know, you can easily just go and delete this docs folder if you don't want it, you just have a web app. And then within packages, you'll basically see a UI folder. So here you can sort of see, we have like a very simple button that's been created. Um, if you click it or say alert box, um, you know, here's the header and so on. And these pieces are then reused in other places in the project. If I take a look here, uh, you can see it's being used for the docs project as a header and it's also being reused um, as a header in the web app, but all we've done is pass in different props um, but, and sort of we've reused it. Sorry, this is cursor that I accidentally opened. Uh, it's a cool AI uh, editor if you wanna try it out, but it's basically VS Code with some other cool AI stuff on top. Um, let's move this away a bit. Um, so yeah, it, but in short, you'll see a TS config. This can basically be reused between the different projects. Here you have ESLint as well. Um, it's being used if we go in the web app. Um, like, can, is there anything I can see here? Um, you'll see, yeah, here you're basically reusing the UI package. You're also using the ES, uh, uh, ESLint config, the TS config, and so on. So basically everything here, you can see instead of having to have a whole bunch of stuff here, you'll just basically extend TS config next JS. And you'll, you'll basically see that in here, um, there's this package that sort of we're using this and this extends, I think, base JSON. Um, it's not too important sort of what's happening here, but imagine you have 10 different Next.js apps. You can just go and like sort of reuse everything and not having to copy and paste. Um, so that sort of, these two are just sort of config packages. You'll see these in a lot of Turbo repos. Here you have a UI folder. I'm just jumping back to the project here and you actually see uh, these developers have even sort of left a bit in. You can see it's not even being used uh, in the project, but they they have left the UI folder. Um, so for that, and here you can sort of see generators. That's also created by Turbo. Uh, this is really helpful, by the way. Side note, but like if you ever use Plop uh, to generate your code, it can be really nice. Um, but in short, you can see we have the TS config. This is basically all just uh, Turbo out the box, so they haven't even gone and changed too much. They didn't even go and delete the UI folder which I probably would have done, but maybe they plan to use it in the future. So here they're basically in their web folder. Um, they have their components. If they wanted, instead of having it here, um, they could be moving it all into the UI package and then they could be reusing, reusing those UI components within the docs app as well. But as you can see, there's no pressure to do that. You can still run the app completely as a regular Next.js app. No pressure to actually put stuff in all the different packages, but if you want to, you can, and in certain scenarios, there will be benefits. If you wanna publish a standalone package, if you wanna reuse it between different uh, projects. Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed that video. In future videos, I am probably gonna go and do something on some of the other pieces that are used in this project. Um, so what did we mention? Upstash, I don't think I've ever actually done a video on what they do, but this is like really cool here. You can see this is what they use for Redis um, to be tested. Um, I wonder if they're using Redis. But anyway, that's here. Tiny Bird, another one I think I'll do a video on in the future. Um, and Terso as well. I actually haven't really used it much, but um, I'd love to do a video on that. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, if you learned anything, feel free to post questions and comments down below. We didn't actually go into the project too much. It was probably more a project about Turbo. Uh, there's a lot of sort of stuff here to, to sort of go into the logic and so on. Um, we didn't do that too much here. But I might revisit this project again in the future to come to cover some of the other things they do. Anyway, be sure to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and yeah, thank you for watching.